Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I must say it was a wonderful introduction to this topic of uh, Ireland as a national brand that my colleague Niall Gibbons gave you, and I think a much better job than I could do just uh, introducing it verbally. So uh, thank you, Niall, <laughs> and I hope that I can provide some interesting insights to follow on from that. Uh, now... I'm not sure where my presentation is, but it's on its way, but maybe by way of just a small introduction. I'm an academic, first of all, so my remit is not to be promoting my country per se, although, of course, I come as a very proud Irish person who would like to promote it. But uh, the job I do, I guess, as an academic and a researcher is to observe and research and find uh, patterns and commonalities in topics, whatever topic uh, we're looking at at any point in time. And the topic that I have been looking at recently is nation branding. And as you are all uh, aware, and I think very much interested in, nation branding is a topic that virtually every country in the world at the moment is paying a great deal of attention to and investing heavily in trying to develop. Uh, and from a, where I stand as an academic looking at this, you find that nearly everything that is written about this is about building brands because most countries are at an early stage of brand development. And for example, our first speaker this morning from Latvia was saying that they consider their brand is just one year old, that their efforts, conscious efforts to build the brand only started about a year ago. And I think one could probably say the same about uh, Dr. Horvath's uh, talk that you know, Hungary has been working on this for quite some time, but it's still relatively recent. He talked about being in the teenage years in terms of the nation brand. Whereas Ireland, we have been, I was going to say that we have been building our brand for at least 50 years from when we set up state agencies to promote our country in tourism and in investment terms and various other aspects. But in fact, listening to the last presentation, I realized that it's much older than 50 years that our brand has been in construction for a very long time. And we've been very conscious as a country of the need to reach out to the international community and attract uh, investment and tourism and all those kinds of things. So we are, one could nearly say, in the mature stage <laughs> as a brand that we have a much longer history uh, and we have reached a much higher level of development in some ways than many of the countries that uh, people here represent. But what struck me as interesting and what I have been working on and uh, trying to investigate is the fact that brands don't stand still. You don't just build them and they sit there on a plateau. Brands are dynamic. They are a, are a delicate flower. They are something fragile and intangible that needs to be minded and nurtured and cherished and that can very easily suffer damage. And the uh, problem that we in Ireland have experienced is that our brand grew and grew and developed on many different fronts simultaneously and was doing extremely well, to the point where one could argue we were almost overconfident. And then we ran into economic problems and all sorts of other things that followed. And that question comes up, of course, what does that do to this wonderful brand that we've spent so long developing? So what I want to do is to take you through a little bit about my thinking on that topic. And so the title, which is now here in front of us, thankfully, uh, the title that I thought I would uh, create uh, a presentation around for today is Brand Ireland an illustration of damage and repair. And I hope the damage is not too serious, but we definitely have suffered a little bit of a, a wobble in recent times. And what I want to do, therefore, is to try and uh, talk you through that and to make some general observations that might be transferable to other countries equally. So I don't really... I intended to start off by just introducing our nation brand in a very, uh, you know, summary way. And I think you've already had a... A very excellent introduction to the tourism side of that. I want to talk uh, to illustrate a little bit of the kind of damage that we have suffered. And then more particularly, I want to say, well, let's look at that damage and let's look at how do we get back from that and what evidence have we that we are making progress back. And I think, thankfully, that the picture is starting to look optimistic and I'm very glad to be able to report that. So just starting at the very beginning, 
obviously, uh, anybody who's involved in nation branding, the first thing you start with is research. And we, as a country, have been researching for many years the images of Ireland and what kinds of things uh, are, are important to attract people. And we have endless volumes of research. I've just given the tiniest little summary here to say, repeated to us again and again, are the fact that uh, we talked earlier about the green summer. Well, the greenness of Ireland and the natural beauty of Ireland is something that comes back again and again and again. The whole world, I think, has knows about that. And the other thing uh, that comes back again and again and again is to do with our people, that Irish people are naturally, I think, very friendly. I hope you'll see that from the speakers you have today, that we reflect this very well. And all of the things that come from that, you know, being a family orientated place, being a nice place to live because it's friendly and accepting, uh, rest and relaxation, it's a relaxed kind of place that uh, people seem to become absorbed into very easily, all of those kinds of things. And those same kind of human values spill over into the business domain, where we are seen as easy to do business with, easy to negotiate with. Uh, you know, welcoming, having a kind of can-do attitude, being good lateral thinkers and able to kind of get around problems, wanting to solve problems. All of those things seem to transfer into people's attitude towards us as business partners. So they're very good uh, things to, to bring with us into a business setting. And likewise, anything to do with business, whether it's a destination for conferences or a place to stay on after a business trip, all those kind of things seem to be very positive and to come forward uh, in our brand. And of course, we, like everybody else then, are trying to find the key issues that we can build upon that will resonate with the market, whether it's you know, e each market segment, and to try to make our brand as strong as possible. And as with all of the other countries here, there are many dimensions to the market, but it comes back to you have to focus, as Dr. Horvath told us so eloquently, you have to have something that is unique and you have to have a focus around it so that you can stand out and have a competitive advantage uh, relative to all those other countries who would also like us to you know, come to visit them or whatever. And uh, what our, uh, this is a very, very simplified view of it, but it seems to me that we have two main dimensions to our nation brand. We have the big tourism dimension, which we've just heard about, and we also have a very strong uh, objective in the business end to attract inward investment principally and to obviously help us to sell all our products abroad to attract exports. And there are two uh, slightly different uh, messages that we use, but they are, uh, I think, very closely connected. And this is, of course, what a nation brand should be, that it may have several sub-dimensions, but to be a really strong nation brand, they should be coherent and they should be coordinated. You shouldn't have conflicting messages going to different audiences. And I think we do a pretty good job with that, that first of all, as my colleague said, that on the tourism side, the main summary statement reflecting our positioning is that we are the island of character and characters, which is the people and the place. And equally on the business side, we say that the, that the phrase we're using currently is we are the island of vibrant possibility, which emanates from the people also, from the creative imagination and the kind of can-do attitude and the sense of being able to have high aspirations. So those things are how we have evolved our uh, nation brand, and the nation brand hinges on all of that. And investing in that and working at it, as we have been doing for many years, um, we, we have got, obviously, very extensive communication programs around each of these. And all I have done here, and it's a very uh, modest little effort to bring together the, the, the tourism and the business brand, uh, is just to say they are both about the island of Ireland, they are both, in a way, about the place and the people, but obviously the execution varies according to the particular target audience. And on the left, I have one of the print ads to do with tourism, which is the uh, little catchphrase at the end, let Ireland uh, take you, you know, on all these exciting and unexpected <laughs> directions. And um, on the right-hand side, there's an illustration of a print ad to do with uh, attracting foreign inward investment. And it says, uh, we're, the thinking now is not about the dollars you invest, but about the people you invest in. 
So it's the same general direction, but it's about investing in the country and investing in the people. And that just captures, I think, the the, the, the visual uh, incarnation, if you like, of our nation brand. And we have been very successful in cultivating that as we've invested in it over the years. And I have just summarized a, a couple of main, main facts about that to say, look, our nation branding efforts have been a roaring success. And I use that uh, sort of pun uh, intentionally because our economic success of uh, the decade, say, from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, was so amazing, really, that it was labelled as the Celtic Tiger years. So the tiger roared happily for that time, but unfortunately uh, he has uh, roared less in recent times, and this is the source of our problem. And just to summarise the few key uh, variables, that over that time our GDP growth averaged 6.3%, and in the latter part of the 90s it actually went up to 10% a year GDP growth, which was way, way, way higher than the average for the EU as a whole. Equally, our foreign direct investment over all those years averaged about 2.5 billion per year. Uh, And we had so much investment and so many new businesses being created that our unemployment went down to, you know, what is considered virtually full employment. We went down to 5%. And our exports were booming and to the point where we had balance of payment surpluses. Uh, We had fiscal surpluses as the norm. Our national debt at that time virtually disappeared and lots of Irish people who had emigrated were able to come home and work in Ireland because there was so much opportunity for them. So it seemed like everything was just about perfect. Uh, It was a a very, very good period of time from that, on the surface at least. So much so uh, that I've just captured the... uh, you know, uh, what people were saying about it. There was a, there's a survey done every year called the Global Quality of Life Survey carried out by the Economist Intelligence Unit. And in 2005, Ireland was designated the world's best country from a quality of life perspective. And they described why this was the ranking by saying that Ireland wins because it successfully combines the most desirable elements of the new which was the highest GDP per head in the world, low unemployment and coupled with political liberty. And it also manages to do this while preserving certain what they called cosy elements of the old, such as stable family and community life. So all of this was wonderful and of course we were paying attention to this international media coverage as well as our own uh, experiences at home. And we were basking in the glow. We were delighted with ourselves and very confident and uh, happy and felt that we were almost a model for the rest of the world. But as my mother would say, uh, (laughs) pride comes before a fall. And maybe we got a little bit too proud and maybe we got a little bit too complacent. And there were a lot of circumstances outside our control. Clearly, the world financial Uh, crash, starting with the the Lehman Brothers problems and so on. Those things were nothing to do with us, strictly speaking. They were a set of circumstances that we found ourselves in. But we were particularly vulnerable in those circumstances because of the, the way our economy had grown at the time. And this particular financial problem that uh, increased and, and accelerated and that we got into deeper and deeper trouble was reflected that not only the reality of the problem, but the manifestation of the problem was reflected in a kind of a media frenzy where there was lots and lots of very negative publicity. Some of it superficial and spurious and trivial, but nonetheless all feeding this sense of problem, problem, problem and nothing going well. And I've just given a few little examples here. This was labelled uh, in September last year, uh, Cowan's global hangover, as you can see. And Brian Cowan was our Taoiseach, our Prime Minister at the time, who just yesterday has handed over to a new person. Uh, But he was, they had a government uh, think tank to consider what to do next about our various, solving our various problems. And uh, this man went on the radio and people said that he had drink taken, that he had been partying the night before and that uh, maybe he wasn't compass mentis. 
when he was giving this radio interview. And this attracted all sorts of media coverage and very negative, and it went all around the world, as I will show you. Uh, th this is a media tracking uh, organization, and they show the amount of media coverage that this prime minister attracted every week, every month, over time. And one of the criticisms of this man was that he may have been a very clever, good politician, but he was not a good communicator. He didn't seem to be comfortable in the media and was not representing us perhaps as uh, well as he should do. But that was an ongoing problem, that his media exposure was relatively low. But on this occasion, when this particular bit of bad news came out, his media coverage went up 692%. But unfortunately, it was not the kind of uh, improvement in media exposure that we were particularly uh, keen to get. And it appeared in all of these countries all around the world. So, of course, we Irish were totally dismayed by this because while we're very happy to have a high international profile, we'd like it to be the kind of profile that we would be proud of. And having that kind of negative reaction is clearly not good at all. So we were watching this with great disappointment. And then, as if that kind of thing was not bad enough, the crisis deepened yet further. And in November, there was the uh, bailout, which was a very real thing altogether, uh, where we were, our financial problems caused us to need bailout by the IMF and the e European, uh, the ECB. And this picture shows the leader of the team. There was a, it says here on the little slide that today, this was November the 18th, the 12 men and women from the International Monetary Fund in suits and sensible coats arrived in Dublin to clear up the financial mess. Well, you can imagine how bad that made we Irish feel, and of course that also got lots of international coverage. So we were in a state of great depression and dismay, and uh, there are various people commenting on it, like one of our um, best-known historians, a man called Dermot Ferriter at home in Ireland, described this day as a devastating and humiliating milestone, that the nation's sovereignty was being compromised nearly 100 years after our hard-fought uh, effort to gain independence. And the Irish Times, which is the most influential newspaper, was talking about the ignominy and the shame of it all. So there was this sense of you know, great despair and great worry and consternation that this was going to be you know, hugely damaging to this brand and to the business and to the employment and all of the very important things that hang on the success of that brand. So we were all wondering where was this going to end or how we were going to get out of it. And it, the problem has kind of lingered and festered and there was an article published just this March, uh, only a few weeks ago, uh, in Vanity Fair by a, a very well-known journalist called Michael Lewis. I don't know whether any of you have uh, come across books like Liar's Poker or there's a new one just out called The Big Short. Which, uh, so he's a very prominent, well-known guy, and he wrote an article which was deliberately very scathing and probably unfairly so. But nonetheless, the problem from our point of view is that it's very widely read, very widely circulated, and therefore potentially very damaging. So this was what got me investigating and trying to examine what can we say or uh, you know, do we, should we be as depressed as we feel uh, at home about this problem, or can we look forward in some way to getting back what position, you know, the position that we had? And I hope that I can offer some observations on that that may be a little bit helpful and positive. And the way I framed it for myself uh, to try to get a grip on this, that if you read any of the theory and so on, um, Simon Anholt and all these well-known people who've written about uh, nation branding, what they will all say is that to develop a, a good nation brand, it's about the convergence between your own identity as a country, who you see yourselves as, and the images of those people externally. And it's not easy to get that convergence in the way that you would like it. And the normal situation for any country as they start even at the beginning to try and build their brand, they'll generally find that their identity at home is positive, it's up there. 
because they know a lot about their country. They're very proud of their culture and their heritage and their natural resources, and they're proud of a lot of things. And But the outside world may not know much about those. Very often, I'm saying that the image externally is often neutral, but the neutral, neutral because people just have a low level of awareness. They don't know much about it, and they don't have any particular opinions about it. Uh, or else... There, maybe they have negative impressions if they have seen something about the politics or you know things that are fairly negative, not very exciting. So usually the task of the people building the nation brand is to pull up the image, the external image, to build awareness and to build positive images that match the identity. And that is what we feel we succeeded doing in doing very, very well. But all of this negative uh, publicity and, and real problems, real financial problems that we have experienced in the last year or two, what it seems to me they have done is that they have dragged down our identity uh, to a very low ebb where, where we Irish are suffering from a kind of crisis of confidence. But that, and we think that because we are seeing all the media coverage and we are being bombarded with all this negative uh, feedback all the time, we feel that our brand and our standing in the world community has got to a low ebb. But actually, as uh, Niall Gibbons, the former speaker, said, when you do research, as they have done, you find that the rest of the world doesn't know much about this. The level of awareness internationally of our problems, it's low on the radar screen for other people. So actually, the, the, the image that we have invested in creating over time and all of those um, impressions that are out there are much uh, more, much stronger and, and much more enduring than we probably believe ourselves. So the problem is more at home possibly than abroad. And to reflect that problem at home, the, there's a thing called the Edelman Eurobarometer, Euro Trust Barometer, and they measure for a lot of countries how the nations feel about their own institutions. And this past year, Ireland, our, we Irish, our trust in our own institutions has put us at the bottom of, of Edelman's ranking. So it's like we at home have lost trust in our own brand and in our own institutions, but people externally may not have the same feeling. And that is manifested. They ask lots of questions about particular institutions, and I've just picked out one or two, that the Irish trust in business and not surprisingly, most of our problems came within the banking sector, so it's not all that surprising that Irish trust in our own financial institutions is at a very low ebb. And Irish trust in our government reached a very, very low ebb. So, And those things are all added together to give the overall index that said Irish people have lost trust in, in a lot of things and lost confidence in themselves. And this is hugely important because until you get those things back, how are you going to rebuild your brand? So, putting all of that together, the question becomes, are we Irish and Brand Ireland, representing us, destined to reside at the bottom of all rankings for the foreseeable future? Or, uh, more importantly, is this going to damage our economy in a real and lasting way? You might have your own opinions about this, but actually my opinion, which is really all I can give you based on what I've been reading and thinking and, and so on, is no, not necessarily. I think actually the outlook is much better than maybe we immediately perceive. And this is for several reasons I will try to explain to you. The first is that Ireland's problems, they're mainly financial problems, they're relatively minor in the scale of events that countries have to deal with. And it's the, the, the more minor the problem, the easier to rise above, if you like. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. The second thing, while we've no research, really, I, I can't think of any single piece of research that I have found that says nation brands recover, or how long does it take to recover from a hit of one kind or another. But we have lots of research on corporations, business corporations, and what happens them when they run into crises. There's a whole of literature on crisis management. So what I have done is I've used an analogy. I've taken corporate crises and looked at what has happened to those. What is the trajectory of corporate crises and recovery? And I've sort of trans translated that into a, a nation brand context. And what that says is that research on corporations uh, 
shows that they tend to bounce back surprisingly quickly, even from very grave problems. And that the speed of recovery is strongly influenced by the quality of leadership and quality of leadership, particularly in good communication. That if you have a strong leader who takes hold of the problem and who communicates very, very well with the relevant audiences, you will get back and recover your position much better. And finally, I want to just show one or two things that, that give, an, give me confidence that the Irish economy is bouncing back in that way quite quickly. Now, on the first of those points, what kind of problems do corporations and countries have to uh, bounce back from? What kind of crises, in other words, or catastrophes do they have to face? The literature would say that there's a sort of a continuum from problems caused by mismanagement, like financial problems, economic problems, which are mismanagement, whether deliberate or inadvertent, inadvertent in our case, I guess. Then you have incidents caused by malevolence, like terrorism or things like that. Then you have confrontations, where you have, say, warfare, or we know plenty of instances of that. Then you have things like technological disasters, like the Gulf oil spill or uh, Chernobyl or things like that. And then you have major natural disasters causing mass fatalities, like earthquakes and tsunamis. So clearly, in terms of gravity, financial problems are very small compared to earthquakes. And arguably, the problems that Ireland is dealing with are at the very low end of that continuum. They may seem big to us, and they do at home, but in terms of the you know, persistent, long-standing damage, that, that would be considered as at the minor end of the scale. So that's, to me, somewhat comforting in a relative sense. Then, uh, if you look at the research, which I have done, on various kinds of corporate crises uh, at that lower end of the scale, um, things like sales of product recalls, you're all aware, probably Toyota last year recalled some vast number of vehicles because they had some fault. There was a famous, iconic example of the Tylenol um, capsules in the States where they were contaminated. Those kind of things where companies have a huge crisis to do with their products. And what happens is when they're, going, they're selling their products for many years on a fairly even keel and all of a sudden some major thing is announced and the sales collapse. How long does it take those sales to build back up? or do they ever get back to where they were? Well, in fact, the evidence from many, many markets is that they actually return to their previous levels surprisingly quickly. Generally speaking, within about six months, the curve is back to where it was before the problem. Equally, that's looking at what customers do and how they respond. But I thought, well, let's have a look at what investors do. And if you look at the share prices, for example, as a evidence of, of what investors do, you find that the share prices of those companies bounce back. And Toyota's share price, for instance, last year took a hit when the recall problem occurred, and it is now back higher than it was that time. And even BP, for instance, where their share price, and, and you know they had such a catastrophe on their hands with the oil spill, their shares have come back. They're not quite back at the level that they were before that problem, but they're getting there. The curve is moving carefully upwards. So um, all of those things suggest to me that the memory of the market out there is actually quite short, and that once people are reassured that the problem is contained, they will revert to their previous pattern of behavior. And so I would be hopeful, and I think your evidence, Niall, that, uh, of the uh, interest in coming to Ireland and so on, suggests to me that the market out there actually is relatively untouched. Uh, you know, it's not damaged terribly by whatever kinds of publicity we've had. There will be a lingering memory factor, and that's the sort of general corporate reputation. And again, there have been surveys done. This one was based on a, a very large survey of 600 and something chief executives of big companies, and they, around the world, and if you put together all of their answers, they all seem to feel that when you have a very bad incident like that, a crisis that the company has to face, that the lingering memory is probably about three years. And after that, it has sort of disappeared into the mists of time. So again, from a kind of a reputa general reputational point, you would hope that gradually uh, the, the people will forget, even if they did know, <laughs> which uh, many probably didn't. But whoever would have been aware of the Irish problems and so on, you'd hope that if you take, say, 
January 2011 or sometime like that as the starting point of the recovery that about three years from now we'd hope to be more or less back and have those problems relatively forgotten about. And uh, some of the things that I did, uh, different kinds of research, just to give you a slight impression of and to give myself some comfort, if you like, about how people are viewing Ireland or what's happening, I looked at things like Google searches and you could find that along with the rest of the world and the economic uh, recession, interest in uh, coming to Ireland, this is the number of searches about travel to Ireland went down, 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 but they have started to turn around and come back. Equally, interest in doing business in Ireland went down, not as much, but it did go down quite a bit, but it's starting to come back. Our exports, which are 75% uh, driven by multinationals coming to Ireland, or working in Ireland, have held up remarkably well. And in fact, last year, our exports were up 6.9%, as against an EU average, which was down 3 point something percent. So that part of our business is holding up very well. We have just recently been ranked, uh, again, as the second country in the world uh, in terms of attracting FDI. So our FDI share is holding up remarkably well. Tourism was hit, but as Niall uh, in his uh, talk just a minute ago said, the signs are very positive that it's turning round. And this is our trust, Irish people's trust in our own institutions, and it's a kind of a um, proxy for confidence, is showing, if you look at the green line, that we're starting to recover our confidence uh, in the various institutions, which is a hu huge sort of foundation that we need to back up our brand. And finally, we have a new government which just took office yesterday and that should solve the uh, need which you often have in these crisis situations for new energetic leadership and hopefully for much better communication to take us forward and to do things on a very a new platform to give us a, a whole new impetus for our brand. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, as our new Prime Minister said in his little slide here. Thank you for your support. And we in Ireland are open for business and uh, would love to talk to you if any of you have interest in Ireland, whether it's for tourism or education or for any of the other things that we are involved in. So thank you very much. Mm. Oh, question. Yes, yes, yes. If you like. Thank you very much, Professor Lambkin. We yeah. can take a few questions. I suggest since we're running slightly behind schedule, maybe we can take a few together, and then I can give it to you for a response. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Juliet Kachenko. I'm a PhD student from Ukraine. Uh, and I have one question. Um, uh, do you, did you have or do you have some governmental programs uh, in order to boost uh, um, foreign direct investments? And uh, what are the main principles uh, they are based on? Maybe like some focuses or just milestones? Were you to, want to be commenting on that? Is there a second yeah. question or a comment yeah. also? Uh, in the back, okay. So we'll take maybe two together then and then, okay. Um, hi, I was actually just wondering uh, how your strategies were different for repairing uh, Ireland's image uh, post Good Friday, so maybe in 1998, versus what you've been dealing with now in terms of repairing its image um, when dealing with an economic crisis. And the final question here. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, I'm from Indonesia, and I love Ireland and the group band Westlife. Oh. It's a my favorite one, okay? Uh, it's a good, good title. Uh, sorry, the title is Dimage and the title of your presentation. Oh, it was uh, Brand Ireland, an illustration of yeah. damage and repair. Uh, the mon uh, an illustration, damage and repair. And the question is how you solve uh, the problem of, uh, relating to the global warming, how it impacting your business and economy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, well, now, th there's a lot of different issues there. Uh, I, maybe take the last one first. The fir the, I have uh, absolutely no answer for solving glo global warming. <laughs> That's a big question that all the whole world is dealing with. Clearly, we have a very strong environmental awareness, and we have people, uh, we have organizations and programs in place who are especially looking at that from an Irish point of view, because we guard our 
environment very jealously because it's, you know, our best resource, if you like. But precisely what the form of that is, I don't know, and it's such a big subject, I don't think we can really address it. On the question of attracting business investment, inward investment, we have another, just as we have a, the very major tourism organization, we have another organization called the IDA, uh, Industrial Development Authority, and their job is to attract business in and to promote Ireland from a business point of view. And it's a large, very vibrant, very active organization. And you could look up their website, and I'm sure you could get quite a lot of information about all of the programs they have going on. And the, uh, their strategy document is up there, so there's a lot of information. So I don't think really that um, I could go, you know, that there's no point trying to go into that, particularly when we have uh, a time constraint here. But it is a very interesting organization. They are regarded as a model of how to be successful in attracting FDI and, and I think they advise lots of foreign governments about how to do the same thing so they are well worth having a look at. So it's IDA.ie for anybody who might like to look it up. But I guess I better stop there because uh, I'm conscious that I'm taking too much time from other speakers. No, not at all. Thank you very, very much for the lecture. We really appreciated it. And, uh, Pleasure. Professor Mary Lampkin. Thank, thank you. you.